Hello, this is Jurius Doctor. I am a teacher with Iron Guard Academy, and uh, as you can tell by the new banner in my YouTube here, uh, I have moved away from the university to a new corporation, Iron Armada. I'm a teacher with Iron Armada, and uh, we'll be helping to teach all our new bros and all you visitors from YouTube uh, how to do basic stuff in Eve. Uh, to start this off, uh, this new trend of classes, this class is going to cover the fundamentals of EVE Online. Uh, with me today, I've got several members of my corp uh, who are going to ask questions along the way, I'm certain. Uh, but to start off, this class is going to cover a little bit of lore, uh, some basics around ship classes and types, uh, and basic commands and glossary that you will encounter while you're just playing the game and talking with other people. Before I get started, any questions, bros? <laughs> They're shy. <laughs> All right, so to begin with, um, and you, you can follow along on your set, guys. Uh, the easiest thing to start with is just basically explaining a little bit of what was captured in the intro video when you started the game for the first time, which is there are four major factions, but these aren't the only races in the game. And I'm going to give you kind of a 30-second nutshell on each of them, which kind of captures a little bit of what's in the video, but also a little bit more that it doesn't get into. So, uh, at one point, Earth um, finds a wormhole shortly after discovering uh, faster-than-light travel near Earth, which took about 7,000 years, uh, really all told, from where we're at in our modern day today. So, it took us a really, really long time to colonize all the planets in the solar system, and then it took about another 1,000 years for us to develop faster-than-light travel, after which mankind went through a really, really fast expansion, and we find this giant wormhole near Tau Ceti called the Atom Gate. No, not the Eve Gate. The other side is called the Atom Gate. A lot of people don't know that, and they've taken that out of a lot of their lore, but it was there in the original Eve online wiki. You know, the whole Adam and Eve thing. Biblical, blah, blah, blah. So they jumped through this ginormous, stable wormhole naturally occurring, they assumed, and I, I think there's probably a little bit of reason to believe that it wasn't naturally occurring, but they find this giant wormhole, and this thing stays open for about 75 years, during which all of the mega corporations of old Earth, the old nations, the, the you know universal Catholic Church, all these big organizations move through and start settling planets and taking over large swaths of land, terraforming new worlds, and you know setting up jump gates to navigate from system to system without having to spend the hundreds of years traveling in between at light speed. And uh, about 75 years go by, and boom, the thing starts to destabilize. The Eve gate collapses. Um, we don't know if it started collapsing at this end or if there was some catastrophic event on the other side, like a supernova that blew it out. But the energy emission from the Eve gate basically set off a chain reaction through the Stargate network and blew out everything and separated everyone uh, from everyone else. And any nations that were dependent upon resources from Earth to keep growing um, failed, pretty much. Uh, most of the ships that were in space in the area of, of the, what is currently a Mars space around the new Eden system, everything basically within seven systems that was in space was vaporized. Uh, star stations destroyed, um, planetary colonies completely wiped out, like it was a huge, huge explosion. And most of the jump gate network, uh, the stargates that connect system to system, they were completely wiped out. Uh, and almost everybody was knocked back to a Stone Age level, basically. So you have these giant ships that have landed on planets or crash-landed, and people who, on the surface, have you know sort of gotten by on the skin of their teeth, pulling these things apart and salvaging them to make farm tools and boats and you know basic technologies. So it, it really did a number. Over the last uh, 25,000 years, um, mankind has slowly recovered to the point where we're back in space, we have interstellar travel, and we've rebuilt most of the jump gate network. Um, there are four major factions, the Amar, which are the, call them the hereditary and cultural descendants of the United Catholic Church. Um, this group, uh, having the longest recorded history uh, of the nations that sort of experienced a great dark age, um, most of their you know recordings are, are dogmatic and, and doctrine in nature and like any good bureaucracy they are slow to move and they favor force 
So you'll find that Amar ships are armor tanked, they're slow moving, but they deal a lot of damage and they hit hard. Uh, their primary damage type is Yemni Thermal, and they use lasers to inflict their damage and sometimes missiles. But their ships tend to favor, you know, brute force and tank ability. Then there's the Galente. A lot of people used to think of them as being the Space French, but really they're more like the Space Northern Europeans. Uh, if you you can think of them in the in the way of you know being focused on democracy, uh, freedom of speech, individuality, and scientific research. The Galente are huge in you know biomedical research, in cybernetics, and in um, drone technology because being that they're so individualistic and free loving, they prefer not to get their hands immediately dirty. They'd much rather have drones go out and do the work for them. The Ore Corporation um, actually began as a Galente venture to increase the efficiency of mining by developing ships and drones that were specifically aimed at mining. Um, as such, the Galente, among all of the races, are probably one of the wealthiest factions um, because they're very heavily vested in industry. Their ships tend to focus on drones for damage. Hybrid weapons, which basically are like rail guns that shoot a plasma charged round, and uh, they tend to favor shields, although they have learned some lessons from the MR in using armor because sometimes it's simply more effective, especially on a larger scale. Then there's the Kaldari, and the Kaldari sort of started as a pet project for the Galente. Um, this planet that exists within Galente space, uh, Kaldari Prime, in the system of Lil Muner, um, began as this, you know, nation of former descendants of Earth who were descended from the mega corporations of Japan, Germany, um, Australia, and the United States, and these nations. Uh, being very, very nationalistic, uh, very family and you know, almost clan-centered, and very uh, capitalistic, um, were for a very long time engaged in internecine warfare and uh, basically pecking order fights that eventually established um, a de facto senate. This is about the point where their technologies were you know, getting good enough that they could break orbit and get into space. And the Galente discovered them and said, oh, let's raise them up to our level. So the Galente started helping them to develop new technologies. And the Kaldari, being as industrious and competitive as they are, said, well, we like your technologies, but we have this new direction we want to take it in. And because they were really, really, really competent when it came to computer systems, they started taking Galente systems and finding ways to screw with them. Um, they invented ECM, which is uh, electronic countermeasures. So rather than trying to work against the systems of the other ship, they simply attacked the main computer, targeting systems and everything else, which is why ECM is so, so broken, but also quite good if you think about it from a cultural level. Uh, they also developed shield emission systems that allowed them to simply protect their ships from receiving damage at a physical level at all. And uh, they tend to favor ships that are fast and maneuverable and use rockets for damage because why would you bother with gunnery when you can just fire and forget? And of course, anything that puts the most damage downrange, which is, uh, if you think about it, a, a very American way of looking at warfare and it still holds true in the Kaldari of the future. So I like to think of them as the Space USA. And then there's the Minmatar. And the Minmatar um, are really not one cohesive nation or one central group of tribes, but really all of the indigenous First Nations and First Peoples of Earth that have left and co sort of banded together. Um, think of them as, as a mixing of not just like the First Peoples tribal nations of North America, but also the Aborigines of Australia, the, you know, uh, the Maasai of Africa, all the different indigenous groups from around the world, the Inuit, um, you know, the Mongols come together and created uh, basically a home for themselves where they could use their industriousness User and joined their, your channel. their mobility and their freedom to get around in a way that um, didn't tie them to any one place. So for a very long time, the Matari had some User joined your channel. And they, had, they were concentrated on those home worlds, but they 
uh, also maintained a very mobile lifestyle and their ship designs are very pragmatic uh, very you know utilitarian and they're focused on speed but because they haven't had really User a cultural drive channel. to keep developing the technologies in the way of other nations they're still using weapons that were developed on old earth so artillery cannons uh, and uh, basically guns that use repellent to shoot around downrange um, so they, they tend to favor their mo their mobility and the ability to just pummel things with grounds so that's the four major factions there are other groups um, the the other groups that you'll, you'll find in space and that you'll encounter are the individual criminal factions like the Angel Cartel and Mordu Legion. Mordu has been a joined your channel. mercenary corporation that basically you know, slaved itself out to different militaries when the need arose for extra hitting power. There are the Sanchez, which, uh, long story short, uh, their leader went crazy and started turning people into slaves. Um, there's the... Uh, Serpentis Corporation, um, which really specialized in the manufacture of drugs and pharmaceuticals. Uh, for a little while, Serpentis owned Ore, uh, but Ore has recently been bought back from them and taken control of by the Upwell Consortium. Uh, interesting note, Upwell Consortium is a corporation owned by Capsuleers and created by Capsuleers. They're the ones who developed the Citadels and the engineering complexes, but they're also the only faction that doesn't have any ships in terms of playable models in the game. Then there are the Drifters and the Jove. The Jove, unlike everybody else, it didn't suffer the major setback that every other faction did when the EVA collapsed. So Jove ships are super advanced and super cool. They're also the ones who gave us pod technology and the ability to create uh, jump clones, um, basically making Capsuleers immortal. Um, and part of the reason they didn't suffer that big setback is that when they left Earth, um, they took everything they needed with them, so they were pretty much self-reliant. They could build and maintain cities that ha that were self-sustaining without relying on resources or technology from Earth. The Drifters are a splinter faction of the Jove uh, that, you know, where, where it breaks off in the timeline is really uh, kind of up for debate, and there's a lot of discourse around it, but basically uh, Drifters are biologically Jove to a point, um, but they have very, very different motivations, and uh, they're definitely at war with the other factions and with Capsuleers. If you open your ship viewer, so you go to your Neocom, and then there's the ship tree icon, which is a box with an A in it. If you start with the Amar at the far left, each race has, I believe it's 56 ships. And there are over 300 in total in-game, but the main four factions um, have somewhere in the range of 220 ships among them. If you zoom out and look at the whole tree, going from left to right, you have the smallest to largest size. And the main first group of um, ships are the frigates, which you will be able to fly pretty much right away as soon as you come into game. Um, just below frigates, there's the Corsair, or what used to be called Nubro ships. Uh, Corsairs... Um, like the Amara Imperor, are introductory ships that you basically get for free any time you lose a ship. So if you fly into a public station in a pod, they will give you one of these, fit with some basic weapons and mining equipment, and one unit of tritanium. No one really understands why there's one unit of tritanium in there, but let's just assume that it's a gift from the gods of New Eden. Frigates, uh, there are six major frigates for each nation, and they all basically have the same roles. Um, as competition will go, the different nations compete with one another, so they're all trying to match each other's technology. Um, in each of these groupings, you will find an exploration ship, a ta fast tackle ship, a small gunship, such as the Tormentor, a brawler, like the Punisher or the Tristan. You will find a um, repairing ship or a um, logi ship as we call them, logistic ships so the Inquisitor is a good example of that and you'll find an e-war ship like the Amar Crucifier each individual race has its own comparisons for that and as you go up the tree vertically from that first group you get the specialized ships um, so you get your 
police or faction um, navy ships, so like the Imperial Navy Slicer, which is a fast tackle and combat ship for the Amor Navy. And you'll find the Crucifier Navy issue, which is an E-War ship. Um, now, the Navy ships will vary from race to race, and they have their own benefits. And some of these ships will be, you know, um, boosted for a particular type of tank or resistance. Um, some will deal more damage, some will have benefits to their tracking speeds or the type of damage that they do, um, or the bonuses for E-War, but um, each of these ships basically falls within its own class unique to its purpose. So if you compare a fast tackle ship like an Atron to a Executioner, they're going to have very similar bonuses, but they'll be slightly different, reflecting the racial advantages of playing, say, a Galante or a Caldari or an Imitar. But more or less, they're all the same. As you move up, you get into um, interceptors, which are fast ships that basically ignore um, bubbles in space, basically anything that would prevent them from engaging in a warp drive. Um, they can still be directly scrammed and stopped by uh, offensive modules. Then there's the assault frigates, which uh, unfortunately got the nerf bat pretty hard a little while ago. They haven't really been you know, uh, brought into line with some of the features of the newer ship. There's the black ops or covert ops ships um, in the frigate size, which are um, stealth bombers and exploration uh, specialist vessels. Then there are the E-War frigates and the logistics frigates. So basically further specialized versions of what you get in the frigate class. Now, using the frigate as a base price, if you move up from there into destroyers, destroyers are two to three times the cost of a frigate. Um, they're basically big frigates with uh, either more tank and versatility or more guns, but they're a little squishy. So frigate level armor, but much bigger ability to uh, expand into more versatile roles and deal a lot of damage. In the example of the MR, there's the Coercer, which gets eight high slots for guns. Uh, they're a great little PvP ship. And then there's the Dragoon, which gets the benefit of drones and other things like nuting, the ability to drain out energy of enemy ships. Going up from there, you get command destroyers, you get uh, interdictors, which again put out the bubbles that stop other ships except interceptors, and then tactical destroyer. Moving to cruisers, cruisers are four to five times the cost of a frigate. Um, Navy cruisers can be ten times the cost of a frigate. Cruisers are the main line ships of your interspatial navies. Um, they are the primary damage dealers in a lot of fleets, especially because they are the largest class of ship that Alpha clones can fly. And in your average block level engagements, cruisers make up to a third of the uh, fight force in a lot of engagements. So when you're looking at fleets of two or three hundred people, there's usually at least a hundred cruisers uh, in most of those engagements, uh, partly because they're fairly inexpensive in the grand scheme of things, and they're easy to reship into. Also, they're easy to train up to. Moving up from cruisers, you get into ships that are uh, typically 20 or 30 times the cost of the price of a frigate just for the base hull. And these are your recon ships, which are basically stealthy uh, damage dealing ships meant for hunting. Your um, heavy assault cruisers, which are exactly what they sound like. They're bigger, heavier hitting, tankier versions of their cruiser cousins. The heavy interdiction cruisers, which just like the destroyer level interdictors, um, they have the ability to create bubbles. They also have modules that they can fit to themselves that make them the bubble. So they create basically a big anchor point, which you cannot escape from by warping out, unless you're in an in interceptor. Then there are the logistics cruisers, and fi finally at the top, one of the uh, higher skill level requirement ships in the game, which is the strategic cruisers. Now, strategic cruisers are unique because you have to put them together, you have to assemble them, and there are um, several major subsystems which you have to have in order to build it. Now, the interesting thing with this is that um, you cannot actually build that ship unless you have one of each of the subsystem types. You can buy the hull, but unless you have all of the subsystems, defensive, electronic, engineering, offensive, propulsion, strategic, it will not let you build the ship. And each of those um, ha subsystems comes with its own skill group. So this is what makes it a little bit longer to train into. They also are unique in the fact that 
um, in a ship of such capital and size, if you have one of them blown up, you lose skill points when it blows up, uh, which can really be a setback for you, especially if you uh, are pretty tight on your skill. Moving up from cruisers, you get into the fast, heavy damage dealing ships, the battle cruisers. Uh, battle cruisers typically come in either command, tank, or heavy assault roles. Um, an example of the heavy assault battle cruiser would be the Oracle, whose guns are designed to hit far and hard because it fits guns bigger than itself, uh, even than its normal battle battle cruiser size. So, the heavy assault battle cruisers are capable of fitting battleship sized guns. And a common fit that you'll find for the Oracle is a Mega Pulse Oracle, which can easily put out a thousand DPS in good skilled hands. The Navy battle cruisers, same deal, basically just a slightly better, slightly stronger version of a battle cruiser. These are often used um, to quite great effect by some pilots, uh, like Chesser, um, as solo PvP boats when you want to engage battleship sized targets. In fact, he's got a number of really good YouTube videos of him flying around an oracle, which oracles are pretty squishy, um, but using his kiting ability to great, great utility and wiping out like entire gangs of battleships. The uh, command ships are basically uh, custom-built FC ships that are designed for boosting and providing advantages to your fleet mates. Um, then you move up into battleship and larger size. Uh, I won't go into detail explaining, you know, in getting into capitals because this is a fundamental class. But basically, if you're a new bro and you want to fight in the big fights, you're going to want to start pushing your skills towards the battleship uh, pretty quickly before you start specializing into the, some of the smaller ships, with the exception of the Interceptor, which uh, if you live in Nullsec, you definitely want to train as soon as possible, if only for the ability to get around and be of utility in fleet. Battleships are the biggest subcapital type ship. They deal a heck of a lot of damage, they have a heck of a lot of tank, and they all come in basically the same three flavors. One that's primarily focused on dealing a lot of damage, one which is a support ship, uh, in the case of the Amar, it's the Armageddon, which has some pretty impressive nuding ability and uses drones for damage. And then there's the APOC, which gets uh, just awesome bonuses to optimal range and tracking speed. So it's a, it's a good ship of the line. Moving up from there, you get into the, I think, the most fun of the battleship size classes, which is the Black Ops ship, which is capable of dropping its friendly uh, ships that are cloaked, or Kovops capable, onto enemy targets by creating a, a mini jump bridge. And then you get the Marauders, and the Marauders are, uh, in the subcap size, the tankiest ships that you can get your hands on. They are very, very, very capable ships in the right hands. Uh, they are very expensive. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see a three or four billion ISK Paladin floating around out there. Um, and with the, with the right setup, they're more than capable of surviving a drifter uh, doomsday weapon um, and, and taking a single or multiple blasts from one in the right hands. Any questions so far on ship sizes? Awesome. So each race has its own, you know, variants of these. Um, when you start getting into the factions, there are the Garistas, you know, the Sanchez, Blood Raiders, and so on. Each of these is typically limited to a frigate size, a cruiser size, and a battleship size ship. User with the joined your channel. With exception of the Sanchez and the Serpentis, which go all the way up to capital. Now, I'm pretty sure we're going to see capital ship sizes in the other factions pretty soon. But, you know, as is anything with game development, those things will get rolled out when they're finished. The only group that diverges from these racial groups is ore. And ore is where you get all of your mining ships. If you want to be an industrialist, this is where you're going to want to start training. You don't necessarily need to be a miner all the time, but there's a lot of uh, advantage to some of the larger industrial ships in here, especially if you want to make capitals. Um, and in that way, training towards the Rorqual so that you can mine like a motherfucker. Um, this is uh, definitely where you want to go. And they are awesome because you can, by yourself and with a couple of support ships, 
basically clean out entire systems with enough time. Solo. Now that covers everything I needed to get into for the ships. I've touched a little bit on the damage types of the different um, nations and, and, and what they do. User left your channel. A really quick cover of the glossary of Eve and the primary ideas is that there are three types of getting around in Eve. There's wormhole travel, there's gate travel, and then there's in-system travel. Each of these come with their own terminologies that you'll hear in Fleet. The word jump is almost always exclusively reserved for something that initiates a session change. And what a session change is, and you'll hear this term, session change. Session change is when you move from one system to another, whether it's going from one system through a, a Stargate into another system, or going through a wormhole into a J-class system or a wormhole system, your browser, your game viewer, your client has to reload space and populate the new region of space with the objects that are in it. So it's basically deleting your current location and putting you in a new location, spawning you somewhere else. And that's called a session change, where it reloads all that information and puts you into the new area of space. It's moving your record basically on the server. Now, se uh, session changes accomplish a few things. Uh, if you ever find yourself where your client's getting stuck and you cannot move you move your moves, mouse around to get your camera angle changed, um, that's a, a bug that sometimes happens if your session doesn't load properly. Well, just jumping back through the gate you came through will fix that. So will viewing a planet in planet mode because it reloads the session, it takes you away from your space view and puts you into planet view, mode view. So opening and closing planet mode will also restart your, your session. Um, there's a few other things that you can do, but for basic terms, if you have to go from one system into another, it's jump. And that's where you'll, he you'll hear the term jump used. Inside systems, there are acceleration gates. And acceleration gates can be found at certain anomalies, green class anomalies, um, and scannable signature combat sites, where what they do is they basically accelerate you towards warp speed, pointed at a specific beacon a given distance away, and at that beacon is a warp jammer. And what that means is that you can be, you, you can use the acceleration gate to get there. It'll warp you specifically to that point and drop you at zero. But once you're in that site, you cannot warp around within the site. You can warp away, you can get away from there, but you can't say warp from one location to another location within 150 kilometers of where you started. Uh, you are in a very small area, warp jammed, and that is to prevent you from taking advantage of some of the game mechanics uh, to get around. For a uh, in-game purpose, you can assume that these sites are uh, typically criminal sites or sites where you know the bad guys don't want you to be able to just get around on them and take advantage of, of tactics to blow them up. So they're gonna make it hard for you by putting a warp jammer there. You can think of these as being instant sites. You can't warp to them from the outside. You can only warp to the acceleration gate and then enter. And these are often called plexes or complexes, especially in faction warfare. So when you open up your probe scanner by pressing Alt P, you'll see a uh, faction warfare site specifically show up as a green anomaly that you can warp to, which will, in the, except in the case of the larges, bring you to an acceleration gate. Acceleration gates also have the drawback of only accepting certain sizes of ships depending upon the type of site that it is. So when you try to activate the acceleration gate, or take the gate, as it's sometimes called, in EVE University they use the term slide the gate. There's different ways of saying it, but usually they'll say gate somewhere in there. They won't use the term jump, though. That's, again, reserved for jumping through a wormhole or jumping into another system. Um, when you try to activate the acceleration gate, it's going to give you a list of the size of ships that you can use to get into it, unless you're in one of those sizes of ships. So if, if the acceleration gate only accepts frigates and you try to go through in a cruiser, it's going to say, sorry, you can't do that. This gate only accepts frigates and destroyers. If you try to jump through in a frigate and it accepts frigates, it's not going to give you a message. It's just going to send you forward into the, into the site. Getting around in system 
you can also, and in between systems, use what's called a sinusoidal field. Now, sinos uh, are basically a beacon. Think of it like a flare that somebody takes out to the middle of the system. User and joined light. your channel. And the moment that sinos lit, everybody everywhere can see. And I mean everybody. And to illustrate this point, close your ship. Open your beta map. Now this should be in your Neocom, but you can also press Control F10. Now the beta map is nice because it gives you the view of space in three dimensions and it's color coded by default to security status. So green space is high sec, orange space is low sec, and red all around the perimeter is your null sec. Now I'm going to show you a little something about manipulating this map that you might find useful. So at the top you've got four icons. You have your layout, your color by, your markers, which changes what you can see in space, and your focus current location. So I want you to click focus current location, and that's going to reorient the map centered on the system you're presently in. Then what I want you to do is go to the color by, go down to, um, let me just see here. User left your channel. Go to uh, Geography and User joined Statistics, your channel. and under Geography and Statistics, click Sinoshiro Fields. It's right at the bottom. This is all of the Sinos presently lit everywhere in EVE. Blue indicates a single instance or a single region within which you can jump. The size of the bubble indicates how far you can warp in from in terms of light years of actual distance. So that's the that's the radius within which you can you can jump to that sinusoidal field if you have a jump equipped ship or bridge to it using a Titan. And the intensity of the color moving from blue towards orange and then into red indicates the number of sinos active in that system. User left your channel. So when you first look at this, this is going to be like kind of a wall overwhelming. It's literally just a wall of color until you start to zoom in. And then you can see just how many Sinos are presently lit out there. And it will tell you if it's an active Sino show generator or if it's a module. So it's, uh, it's interesting to be able to look at this and see just how many Sinos are active. But yes, each and every one you light, everyone can see you but not everybody can jump to you. Another interesting note here is that if you look at color by and you go down to geography and statistics, one of the options is ships destroyed in the last hour. If you click that, you'll see a much smaller map in terms of coloration. Each single yellow circle represents a ship has been destroyed centered in that system in the last hour. Uh, areas where you see a great big red circle, that's where a big fight has gone down in the last hour. The bigger the circle and the darker the red, the, the more ships were killed in that location. So if you're out roaming and you want to know where to go for fights and you want to see who's been active, this is how you do it. This or basically the same information you can get parsed from .lan, which is evmaps.dotlan.net. But basically it's giving you exactly this information presented in a, in a somewhat more linear format. Now other basic terminology that I'll cover, you'll hear the term burn. When you're navigating in space and you're you know warping around or you're moving in a fleet, somebody will say burn to this point. What that means is turn your prop mod on and start heading in that direction or head towards the aligned object. People will misuse the term burn a lot, but it should, under best circumstances, always mean turn your prop mod on. Now, good FCs recognize that not everybody you know, acknowledges that as being the standard, so they will often say, you know, give me one cycle of your prop mod, which means 
click your pot rod, let it turn green, click it again so it turns flashy red, and meaning it will turn off at the end of the cycle. If we say two cycles of pot mod, click it once, let it run once all the way through, and then turn it off. Free burn, or make best speed, means if you have a course from where you are to a system, say 10 or 12 jumps away, and they say, I want you to free burn to X system, you're going to make your own way there as fast as you can and stop when you get to that system. So free burn or make best speed means get yourself safely from here to there, but get there quickly. You'll hear people say things like get in under their guns. What this means is that if somebody is using turrets to fire on you, those turrets have a speed at which they can track, meaning go from one side of an arc to another. And the way to think of this is that um, your ship can go only so fast, depending on how you've got it fit. If you think of your ship as being a uh, like a baseball, and I'm going to throw that baseball from left to right across somebody's field of field of view, and that person's going to throw a baseball of their own, and they're going to try and hit the ball that I'm throwing. That's basically how gunnery works. So gunnery is the, the ability for that person to lead the target that is you being thrown across their field of vision and to hit you. Now, if that person's got shitty reflexes and they don't turn very quickly, they're, they're always going to end up throwing the ball behind you. If they are really quick on the draw and throw really hard, they might overcompensate and miss by hitting in front of you. But as long as they can track ahead of you, there's a chance they're going to hit. If you can go fast enough that they can't follow you, speed tanking, they're not going to hit simply because they're going to miss all the time. But there's a range, a sweet spot within which the farther you are away, the easier it is for them to hit you because they have longer to compensate. The closer you are to them, moving at the same speed, the faster they have to turn to be able to hit you. It's kind of like trying to um, grab something off the top of a moving car as it's driving right past you. You know, you see it coming, you've got a little bit more preparation time, but the closer it gets to you, the faster you have to be able to compensate for the fact that it's moving by you. It's pretty basic physics. So getting in under their guns means that you take your transversal speed, your ability to move around them, and you get close enough to them that they can't turn their guns fast enough to hit you. And once you get in under their tracking range, uh, tracking speed in, in respect to the range at which they're firing, they can't hit you after a certain point. So um, I'll get into the math in a gunnery class later, but how it basically works out is the closer you are to them and the faster you're moving, the harder you are to hit. So when somebody says get in under their guns, it means find a close orbit, go as fast as you can, and once you're not taking damage and you're, you're orbiting them and you've got a good orbit on them, start returning fire. The trade-off in this is that if you're really, really fast or you're in a very fast-moving frigate, you will actually have to intentionally slow yourself gun, your, your, slow yourself down so that your own guns are able to hit because your guns might not be able to track for the fact that you're simply moving too fast yourself. Any questions about that? Missiles, pretty basic. Um, they're fire and forget. Missiles do damage based on two things. Uh, signature size and explosion velocity. Um, explosion velocity and absolute velocity are tied together. What that means is how fast does that explosion go from its zero point where the missile is to as far out as that can deal damage. So how big is the explosion area and how fast does it take for that explosion to happen? Are we talking like nuclear warhead going off? Or are we talking like bottle cracker? So um, explosion radius can be overcome by absolute speed fast your ship is moving. If your ship moves faster than the explosion radius of the missile, it's going to go off behind you. You're not going to take a lot of damage. 
and then there's signature size. And the easiest way to understand signature size in missiles is in the analogy of somebody trying to throw a baseball at another baseball. A target painter makes something look bigger. So if the baseball that I'm throwing that you're going to try and throw a baseball to hit suddenly becomes the size of a watermelon, well, you're going to find it pretty easy to hit the watermelon. But if you have the ability to make your signature smaller, imagine trying to th hit a thrown ping pong ball with a baseball. It's much harder. So signature size can affect whether or not that missile is able to adequately apply damage based on the size that it is. If only a very small percentage of the explosion area is hitting the, the, the surface area, the signature area of your ship, well, you know, if your ship's signature is 10% of the optimal of the missile's explosion size, then you're only going to take a tenth of the damage. And that's before you account for explosion velocity and speed. So by being very small and very fast, it makes it much harder for missiles to deal damage to you, which is why battleship class missiles deal almost no damage to frigates. Other good things to note, you will hear people say, anchor up. Each FC has a different uh, idea of how far you should anchor from them, but anchor typically means set a keep at range on the FC or whoever the anchor is that is called in a fleet. So you will set on that person keep at range, say 500 meters or 1,000 meters, whatever the default's been set by your FC. And whenever you come out of warp, the anchor on that person, meaning that that person controls the movement of the fleet. If that person moves, everybody else follows. You'll hear the term scatter. <laughs> Usually this is happening when you're about to get wrecked. User left your channel. Scatter means find an object, a celestial a bookmark, something in space that isn't where you are and get yourself there. Get away. Basically starburst out in a random direction and go off to another location. Once you get there, bounce, meaning you get there, you pick another random celestial and you warp to it and you keep moving until the FC gives you a muster location or a place that you can all get back to. Other common uh, statements or phrases that you'll hear are things like overheat. Overheating means that you're literally forcing too much energy through your modules. They're going to do a little bit of extra damage or be able to absorb a little bit of extra damage within a given amount of time. But the drawback for that is that they are going to burn out. You're pushing them farther than they can go and eventually they're going to fail. Uh, you do have a skill called thermodynamics that lets you adjust how much you can compensate for that heat damage of pushing too much energy, energy through those modules and that will slow down that process so that your, your weapons and your uh, defensive modules will last longer when you're overheating them but they still will eventually burn out. That damage can be repaired with man out repair paste or by sidling up to a uh, engineering complex or a citadel that is friendly to you or open to your group your corporation or yourself, uh, and it will provide you free reps. You can also dock at any station and get a repair quote and have your ship repaired by the maintenance people in that station. If, uh, if somebody's giving you the order to overheat, typically it's going to be your weapons, but uh, the FC will call that. There is definitely advantage to overheating your prop mods. You go faster or over uh, overheating your defensive modules, you can take more damage. The trade-off in that is that if you overheat your defensive modules and they burn out, you're dead. Pretty much. That should cover most of the basic um, glossary that I had laid out. I think that the last remaining one that I could probably cover is the difference between an anomaly and a signature, which is that if you open your probe scanner by pressing Alt-P, probe uh, Scannable locations will show up as a signature with a 0% next to it, meaning that you haven't put up probes and begun scanning for it. Um, there are locations, either wormholes or combat sites or data sites or relic sites that you can scan down and then warp to once you've fully narrowed down where that thing is in space. And the other one's anomalies are the green locations that you can warp to, uh, and those are sites that have a beacon saying, here I am, you can come to me now.
but exploration in this game is entirely focused around pretty much scanning down those sites that aren't immediately visible to themselves or to anybody else. Any questions? Anything at all, don't be shy. No. Awesome. Well, that covers the uh, EVE fundamentals. Um, I will have another class later on fleets and fleet commands, and I will be over the course of the next couple of weeks teaching classes on fitting and recording videos for those, as well as uh, uh, classes on gunnery, missiles, and uh, electronic warfare. Thanks everybody for joining me. I'm going to stop recording now and you have a good rest of your day.